Welcome everyone to another CTC Software webinar. My name is Sean Zerbis, the Director of BIM Development here at CTC Software, and today we get to continue the Hive CMS Admin Learning Series, focusing very much on how to create and manage your libraries, your custom internal libraries to your firm. Now, of course, as always, these webinars are recorded, and if you happen to be seeing this on YouTube, or if you are watching it now and live, and you want to see it on YouTube when it goes live, it's a good idea to subscribe to our YouTube channel, so you can uh, ring the bell and get notified when we post new webinars. Uh, and also, as always, for those of you who are participating with us live today, we like to pay attention to the questions window while we talk, so if you have a question about today's topic, feel free to throw it into the GoToWebinar questions window, and I will try to answer that while I'm talking about that topic. But let's jump into the actual conversation here of what we're going to be talking about today. So in previous webinars, we've talked about public libraries and how you can subscribe to those so that you can access content without needing to upload anything of your own. Uh, and now perhaps it's time for you to build your own custom internal libraries for your firms, for your content that just your users get to see. And we're going to do all of this in the Hive CMS. Well, libraries really are the critical organizational control you have for your company when you're kind of managing your content in Hive. You don't want to go crazy overboard and treat it like a bunch of folders, but you do want to use these uh, strategically to establish kind of the best experience your end users can have. Uh, some high, high level filtering and some high level rights control. And really, you want to make sure that your users can use and leverage these libraries to navigate the content as efficiently and effectively as possible without creating extra work for yourself. And so in this webinar, I'm going to really try to highlight all of the information around your library creation, your library administration, so you know exactly how to go through the exercise of building your own libraries within the Hive CMS environment and within the portal. So we're going to cover a couple of major things today. I'm going to talk about really what a library is, kind of what its use is or can be used for in your firm. We're going to kind of uh, outline a little bit of a plan for establishing your library organization. If you're a note taker, that's a great place to take a couple of notes for yourself in planning out what you're going to do in Hive or re-planning, re-establishing what you might do in Hive. We're going to create a custom library and take a look at some of the rights options that you have, uh, just kind of the basic options, and then also use that to control access to custom libraries for the end users. And I have an end user account signed into my Hive CMS right now, so we can actually see the effect of what that's going to do within the uh, Hive portal and in the Hive CMS for the end users themselves. And since I'm not big on death by PowerPoint, I'm going to be doing all of this stuff live. If you want to follow along with me, I encourage you to do that. You can do that by simply going to ctcsoftware.com. You can use any web-enabled device, your smartphone, a tablet, Chrome web browser, your kid's Chromebook. It doesn't matter. If you've got a web browser and you can get to ctcsoftware.com, we can go through and manage these libraries. So first things first, we're going to talk about here what is a library, and apparently I didn't have proper caps and smalls in all my letters, so it looks a little squirrely here. Let's fix that real quick. Um, capitalize each word, please. Let's do that. Oh, it doesn't want to do it? No, it doesn't want to do that. We'll do it manually. There we go. What is a library? I like things to look good and clean and consistent, so we're going to go ahead and update that. All right, so first off, in Hive, if I jump over to the CMS itself, a library is just a bucket into which a bunch of content can be thrown. It's a manual, subjective organization. Uh, as a manager, when you're processing content in, it's a bucket you throw your content into. It's a bit of rights control. I can choose how users interact with this bucket of content right here. Uh, and if they see it at all in the first place. So this user, Joe, can only see a small selection of my libraries. They don't see everything. Uh, because I don't need them to see everything. And you'll see in a moment when I jump into the um, portal side uh, wh where I have some extra libraries that this Joe user is unable to see. As far as being able to see it, if they can see it, they can pull content from it, they can search it, they can, they can use that, but it's also kind of a high-level filter, right? If I wanted to find just all of my corporate Revit content, 
or potentially all of my corporate Revit content for a particular discipline, I can have a bucket of Revit content for my organization and simply browse to that. Or in my case, I've got some MEP content here that I can browse to quickly and uh, be able to search all of that content in one step. It's not designed, so I'm gonna talk about what a library also is not. It is not designed to be used for sort of Revit categorical uh, organization or AutoCAD categorical uh, organization. And the reason for that is because you've already got automatic built-in filters for Revit categories down here. The library is more for if the user can see it and how they can interact with it and then very minor, super high level filtration. Uh, so just kind of narrowing down to a general collection of content, not specific categories or specific anything else inside of here. So one of the things you want to kind of do is organize your library in a way that really makes sense for you. I'm going to pull up the portal here. And I'm going to take you through how I have mine organized and how I've seen a lot of other firms organize their content very successfully. So to get here, by the way, after I signed into the portal, I went to the CMS tab, and from the CMS tab, I went into libraries here. So I have all of my libraries available. I'm gonna set this to show me 25 libraries at a time. And uh, with that, it's gonna show me all 11 of my libraries that I have as an organization. And uh, if I was to pull the user's Hive forward once again, you'll notice that this user does not have all 11 libraries. For example, Revit Content MEP Productivity Pack Schedules 2, a little supplement pack I'm working on right now, uh, that does not appear for this user yet because I'm not ready to release it to them. So I have full control over what they see and even how they interact. And we're going to talk about what that looks like a little bit later on here. Okay. So uh, what, what is the organization structure that we want? Oh, good Lord, I got my screens all mixed up here and I gotta get the right window forward, here we go. So uh, let's pull this back forward. Uh, so by, uh, by product, actually, by kind of major software or major task is a good way to think about this. So I've got my civil content, my AutoCAD civil 3D content. In fact, I've got a few AutoCAD libraries here that are all organized really by the, the product that it's serving. I have a Dynamo library here. There's Revit content, so I'm organizing that in its own separate space. And then things that are common for my whole firm, for example, my standards and procedures library. This is all of my documented standards. It could be AutoCAD and Revit together. And in a lot of cases, I'm doing similar things with there. So I might have just sections that are specified for AutoCAD standards versus Revit standards. You may just have production standards. Um, publishing standards, that might all be up to you. Um, but my standards are all in one location here. I also have all of my templates here in one location. This is Word document templates, Excel templates, Revit templates, all of it is in one location. And my files are named clearly enough that users can figure out exactly what they're supposed to be using. And I also have some design app specific filters that I can use on top of this that makes it really easy for my users to find what they're looking for within these particular within this particular library. And then finally, I have a staging library down here, and I'll talk about this a little later on. Many of you have asked me questions in the past about how can I get more of my design team able to add content, but I don't want it officially released until I'm ready and I've reviewed it. Well, there's a way in Hive that you can do some management to that, and I'll show you an example of how that might work for you in, uh, by using the Z staging library. So really by design app is kind of the core by design app or task. And then within that, you might subdivide, say, a design app by discipline. And that's probably as detailed as I'd go. Some of you might go by office instead of uh, by um, discipline. That might work better or by discipline and office. But that gets a little, a little extra detailed there. And that might be just a little bit too much uh, management here because you have to be picking libraries into which content will be pay placed when you're processing stuff in. So this is good for the end users to filter, but it's also good for you to keep this kind of uh, minimized so that you're not causing yourself all kinds of a headache as you're trying to process content in, right? It's gotta be a healthy balance between the two. So let's talk about how you can create a custom library. Like what does that process look like in the portal to build a brand new library? I'm gonna build one right now, and I'm gonna build one for 
uh, my architecture team specifically. So Revit content for architecture for my company. Uh, so I'm going to build a brand new library. The library, when you when you go here in the library's control area, there's this little plus sign up here, and this is where you add a brand new library. You can also, by the way, delete your libraries and all the content in them if they're only in the one library by checking the box in front of the library and hitting the little delete option here. In this case, we're trying to create a brand new one. I'll come back and delete it later for cleaning up after myself. But this is going to be a library, and I like to call it out again by the product name. So in this case, Revit, specifically the Revit content. Uh, this is all the Revit families, schedules, details, sheets, everything is going to get dumped into this library. And this is going to be specifically for architecture. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and say arc here, or uh, arch, or whatever you want to call it. And then I'm going to suffix this intentionally with my corporate initials. So uh, C, um, CTC. Uh, little e here for my little Express Tools fake company here. So Revit Content Arc CTCE. I can give it a description if I want to. Uh, in my case, because of the settings that I currently have in my organization, I have the ability to make it public. None of you most likely want to make your content public because that means that everybody and their uncle can subscribe to this library for free, and you probably don't want your content released for free. So I typically, in my organization settings, turn off the ability to make public libraries. In a recent webinar talking about public libraries, I turned it on. So I had the ability to do that. And I forgot to turn it off again. Uh, I am going to make this library cloud hosted. So I'm going to choose the checkbox here to upload my content. That way, anything that I put into this library will get published to the cloud uh, as well. And that way, my users can use it from wherever they are. So as I'm processing content in, Hive also caches that in the cloud location, again, making it usable everywhere. And it does some special stuff with Revit and AutoCAD content uh, that makes it even more efficient than pulling it off your own local network, even if users are in the main office. So I'm going to go ahead and create this library here. Uh, it's going to create it. It's going to add it to the list, alphabetize it, of course, uh, and then it's going to throw back up the next step in line, it's going to edit that library automatically where I can choose to publish some kind of an image. I don't know if I have a good image to choose, so I'm going to skip this step right now, and we'll see what that does when I actually use some content that might be in this library inside of Hive a little later on. My next major, very important step is the permissions. And by the way, you can always change that library image to whatever you want, and I'll show you what that does again in the Hive space. Uh, once we get over there and do some quick searches. The permissions area here is the next very important step. In fact, that's the next major slide in my little slide deck here, which is controlling access. This is the key for how my users interact with my Hive library. So with this pulled up, there's two ways you can control permissions, either by leveraging your user groups up here, and uh, we have an entire section dedicated just to user groups in that uh, Hive admin series playlist. I recommend you go check that out. But user groups are a really powerful way of controlling how individuals can gain access to the library. Now, if you're a one-person firm, two-people firm, whatever, you don't necessarily need to use the user groups. You can just go directly to users and add a specific user directly to this list. I can go choose any of my uh, users in my company and add them one by one and selecting their roles. I don't find that to be the most efficient, though, because then every time I add a user, I have to go through as many libraries as I need them to get access to and add them with the proper permissions. Whereas if I just leveraged user groups, I could throw them by default into the everyone group, which is what I often use, or a discipline-specific group where I can put them in that group and then whatever libraries have access to that and potentially licensing and other things that relate to the workflow in the uh, CTC portal, they will have access to all those things in one step. So it saves a lot of time. So I do really recommend you leverage groups. In this case, my Revit content arc here is for my architecture team. And so I have built a user group called DI Architecture, and I'm going to add that specifically to this library. I'm going to break from my typical workflow and not add everyone to it, because this is really only for my architecture team. So I'm then going to select a role for these users within this library. There's three individual roles you can choose when you add a group or a specific user to a library. Either they can be a consumer, meaning they can see it and they can pull content out of it, 
or you can make them a contributor and they can see it and pull content from it, use that content, but they can also contribute back their feedback and potentially tagging depending on your organization settings. You could also make them a manager of a library. I'll show an example in a minute here where you might want to do that. A manager level means they can, for this one library, actually process up additional content, their own content into this library. So if you wanted to make them a manager, you may not want them to be able to process content into all libraries, maybe just this one. So you can make them a manager for that. Now my whole entire architecture team, I don't want them being managers of this library. But if something is wrong with the content in this library, I certainly want them to give me feedback on that, to actually review the content and let me know where something's wrong. So I'm gonna intentionally make the architecture team contributors to this library so they can contribute their feedback and potentially update tagging for content that's discovered in this library. So I'm gonna add them to my list and I'm gonna update this particular uh, library here, this uh, Revit content architecture library. The very last tab is in case I needed to invite people from outside of my company. I'm not gonna talk about that today. We've got a special webinar in, uh, about that specifically elsewhere. So in this case, I now have that library added into my environment. And now I don't remember exactly if Joe is a member of that user group, but I'm gonna go ahead and refresh this list real quick and just see if that architecture library does show up. Yeah, it doesn't appear that Joe is a member of that list, and that's okay. If Joe's not a member, then Joe does not see that Revit content arc library for CTC Express Tools. Just users who are in that group do. So this is one way where I can control their access in the first place. In fact, again, there's a lot of these libraries like the Revit content MEP schedules where Joe is not a member of the MEP user groups either. So therefore, Joe doesn't get to see that particular library, even though they probably are seeing this one and shouldn't really, because they shouldn't be using that one either at this point if they're not a member of the MEP group. But regardless, they now have access. Now let's take a look at a couple of other libraries here that I have set up, like my standards and procedures library. This is kind of an important one. This library here, I very intentionally in the permissions have everyone have access, but everyone is exclusively a consumer of this library. Now what this means again is they can find the content, they can open the content, but they cannot leave me feedback, they cannot adjust tagging within this library. So let me show what that does. If I go into the Hive CMS and I'm gonna run a search specifically on standards and procedures here, and it's just gonna pull up a whole bunch of Word documents or PDFs or whatever. This, this content here is all exclusively in the standards and procedures library. I'm gonna make this a little wider and intentionally open up my details panel here. And with the details panel, you'll notice that with a piece of content selected, if I expand out or collapse the reviews, there aren't any reviews on this, but when I expand reviews, this user does not have the ability to leave a review. They can still see the reviews left by others, but they can't leave a review themselves. So that's because they are a consumer. Now they could absolutely double click on any of that content and it would open it up and they would be able to you know, view it, use it, consume it, whatever, but they can't actually leave feedback or adjust tagging for that content. Again, also, if I go here and right click, there's no, uh, well, there is managed tags, but it would actually not let me do it. That's actually kind of an error. It shouldn't be letting me assign tags here, so I'll fix that later. Um, let's take a look at another example here. If I go into the Revit content CTC Express tools, this is the one where basically all of my corporate content goes, the general content that everyone can use, and here I have everyone is specifically set up as a contributor. So with this, the contributor right there, that means that they can adjust tagging. They can right click and leave feedback. They can leave a review. So let's go find this. Uh, let's see here. Uh, if I jump over into uh, Hive again and I go search for my Revit content CTC Express tools, we'll just do a general search for everything. I'll pick something at random over here. And when I select this, you'll notice Joe actually did leave a feedback for this already, so they can edit their feedback or remove their feedback if they wanted to. Something else randomly picked, just the next item in line, there's the ability for Joe here to write a review. And also, if Joe right clicks, manage tags is expected to work here because, well, they are a contributor and they should be able to manage tags, assigning and removing them from this content because of how my organization settings are configured. All right. 
So let's take a look at another kind of configuration here for my libraries. I'm going to re-show all of my libraries. In fact, Dynamo might be a good example here of where I might have some uh, mixed group associations for my libraries themselves. So I'm going to click on Dynamo. Staging is another example. I'll come back to that in a minute here. With the Dynamo library, um, with my permissions set here, I have everyone set as a contributor. Now again, contributor means that all these users can leave feedback on the content. They can review it. So if a Dynamo routine is broken, I want them to be able to let the managers of this library know that something's broken. And speaking of managers of the library, I have some really good Dynamo power users in-house. And for those Dynamo power users, I want them to be able to maintain the Dynamo routines. It's not something I'm good at, but maybe they're really good at it. So I made them intentionally managers of this library. So anybody in that user group will have the ability in Hive to actually add content, to process in content, and specifically choose the Dynamo CTC Express Tools library here. They'll be able to process content up. So if they get bad review on something like, hey, it's not working in this version of Revit or this version of Dynamo, whatever, everything broke, and it's all going down the tubes, well, then these Dynamo power users can actually jump in, fix that routine, update it, and reprocess it back in. That way, it doesn't have to just filter through me as a as a man as a um an administrator another thing that works really well down here is this staging library i mentioned i was going to talk about this and i'll talk about it now this is a, a a place where i have bim managers in my firm who maybe they're not hive administrators maybe they're just sort of uh, more i maybe should have used the term bim coordinators they're really good revit users but they're not necessarily responsible for building all of the content Maybe I want to vet their content just a bit before I actually put it into the main library. And so for these BIM managers, I've made them a manager of this particular library. Whoever is in that group can maintain or can add content here. They can't add content anywhere else necessarily unless they're in other groups, but they are managers of this particular library. So they will be able to process content directly into Hive. Now at this time, I'm kind of pre-vetting what they're doing, but in the future, I may very well go to everyone here and add everyone as either a consumer or contributor so they could find the content that the managers have processed. For right now, I'm kind of intentionally protecting this library. I'm giving this as a staging place. If the content is great, I can simply allocate it to a different library and then remove it from Z staging. And then it's in a library that maybe everyone or specific groups of people can see. So I've very, you know, kind of carefully built up this library. So I have a staging grounds for that content. And this library, just like all of my libraries, are all set to upload content. And this way, when users are outside of my firm, uh, again, they uh, and BIM managers, for that matter, outside of my firm, or not outside of the firm, but outside the main office. Maybe they're working from home, or they're working from a job trailer, you name it, whatever. When they're processing content into this library, it's publishing into the Hive cloud. And that way, users outside of the firewall and admins outside the firewall of my company who aren't VPNed in, they can still process content in. And then when I eventually move this to an official library, that content has already been uploaded and my users can consume it again without being attached directly to my network. So Hive really has that nice advantage. Though there might be certain times when you might make yourself a special library for a special customer. And that special customer may have requirements that their content is not allowed to be processed to the cloud. So what you can do then, let me go find that one that I just made this ARC library here. Let's, let's modify this a little bit and repurpose it for a different use. Revit content, and maybe this is specifically content that's not for me as an organization, but maybe I'm doing work with um, the Department of Defense, right? So if I'm doing DOD style work, I cannot publish their details especially and a lot of other content to the cloud. Like that's not allowed. So I would choose to not upload that content. And then when I update the rights of this library, any content processed into this library from this point forward will only exist on my network. And my users will have to be attached to my network behind the firewall to even be able to consume any of that content. And I'd probably have a special user group for DOD designers that are only allowed to see that library in the first place. And when they consume it, they have to be inside the office to be able to do that or attached to my network where that content exists. So that is an option that you have. Now, in this case, I'm going to clean this up. 
go ahead and delete this uh, for now because I don't really want that in here. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the preview icon that I attached to some of my other libraries. The end user here, Joe, when they're searching for content, they can see a little icon down here, this little smaller preview. In my case, this is like my corporate logo, right? My, my CTC uh, logo right here. Or if I was searching for content that's in the MEP productivity pack, I can see that little logo for that particular pack. Or if I was searching for out of the box content, since I subscribed to a public library in a previous session, uh, I can apply a search for this and all the content from that library shows up with the Autodesk logo, at least the older Autodesk logo uh, on it here in this case. And so uh, if, if they were searching sort of willy nilly without filtering for anything in particular, you might see a mix and a match of different kinds of content, like a lot of MEP or CTC content. And eventually, uh, say I searched for door, just kind of filtering this down a little bit. Uh, yeah, I can see all three at the same time. Now, in this case, I have my, my kind of preview set up for list, so I can see the name here as well. But a lot of us actually work in sort of more of a tiled view like this, where I'm just seeing just the tiles. And this little quick indicator is great because now I can know the exact source of this content, even if I can't necessarily identify it by the name. I know what the exact source is. This is my corporate content. This is sort of a, a, an external pack of content. Uh, this is some Autodesk content. And then that little icon there, that doesn't get in the way when we're taking a look at sort of an enlarged preview. If I mouse over the single door overhead here, it still pops up with a larger preview. Um, and uh, doesn't actually have that little logo in the bottom right corner of it, it's just showing the preview for it itself. Sort of a nice little thing that's there available now with your libraries if you put those little preview icons on there. Gives a good idea where stuff's coming from. Okay, I think I've covered all of the detail about libraries that I want to cover. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and, you know, start with saying thank you to all of you who have attended. We always appreciate when you show up live. Uh, for those of you watching this on YouTube, again, thank you for, you know, making it to the end of the video. We also look forward to seeing you in future CTC webinars. Our events page has, you know, three months worth of uh, webinars all posted right now. Uh, we hope that uh, you, you find some that are interesting for you. Sign up for those, and we look forward to seeing you in the next CTC webinar. So thank you. Have a fantastic day.